Thanks for coming today to um, hear more about attracting pollinators to your yard. I want to introduce Elizabeth Rothschild. She is a board member of Ohio Lepidopterus and an expert in moths and butterflies. And I'm really excited to um, have her with us today. So I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth. Okay. Hello. I don't know if you can see me because I'm still sharing my screen. You can see me? Okay. Good. Um, and I just want to quickly mention that this hasn't really been publicized yet, um, but with COVID and everything, they are, uh, we are going to have the Ohio Odonata Conference at, at Five Rivers Metro Parks this summer um, in June. So that's dragonflies. So that's going to be a really great opportunity for people to go to if they're interested. So keep an ear out um, for that. And we're going to sort of gear it towards uh, newbies. So if you don't know anything about dragonflies or want to learn some more, uh, please, you know, keep your ears open for that. Okay, so hello, I'm Elizabeth Rothschild. Um, and thank you for coming tonight. And I want to talk a little bit about pollinators. Um, I have been giving talks on pollinators for uh, over 10 years now. And there's a lot of information out there. So let's just get started. I'm sure we can get this going. So if we are talking about attracting pollinators, because that's what we're looking at doing, um, we, I put a question mark there because when we talk about attracting pollinators, it's, it's a sort of PC way about talking about um, attracting things like bees and butterflies, but really what we're talking about is insects. And for a lot of people that can be kind of hard. There's sort of this gap between the concept of pollinators and the concept of insects. Because when we're talking about pollinators, we're talking about a lot of different kinds of insects, actually. You know, we like to think about bees, but there's also quite a few other types of insects as well that pollinate. Um, and a lot of these photos are photos that I took of uh, critters that are actually in our area. So like this, one of my favorites here is the wavy eyed muck sucker fly, which partially is because of the name, but also because of those crazy eyes that they have. But it's a type of fly that does a lot of pollination or this beautiful zebra conchalotes moth, um, which, you know, I get these at my house sometimes. Um, and I'm in Centerville and it's a beautiful moth. And at nighttime it's out there pollinating. In this case, it's on a uh, wingstone. There are also beetles that um, pollinate, again, surfid flies, um, and then wasps. Quite a few wasps um, are pollinators as well. You can see how fuzzy this one is. And many of these insect predators do double duty as well. It's not just that they're pollinators, but like that earlier uh, katydid hunter and the steel blue cricket hunter, not only are they pollinators and using nectar, but they also um, are part of the ecosystem and they are also predators that, um, that keep pests in check. So like the steel blue cricket hunter goes and finds any type of grasshopper that might be in your lawn and uses that to feed its young or surfid flies that we just talked about, um, of which the wavy-eyed mudrucker is one. Um, the larvae actually eat aphids. And then even jumping spiders and a lot of spiders, even though they're not primary pollinators, they do have a role, they do pollinate to some extent. Um, young spiders actually need nectar uh, early in the season um, and spiders have been seen quite a bit nectaring as well. So a lot of these things, and technically spiders aren't insects, but we're lumping them in with it. But a lot of these different insect families have many, many pollinators in them. So one of the things that I really want to try to get across is that, you know, because sometimes my tissues classes, they're like, how do I attract butterflies? Um, and now we're starting to say, how do I, you know, 10 years ago, it was just how do I attract butterflies? And now people are sort of moving into how do I attract bees? But really what we need to talk about is attracting insects in general. Um, so one of the issues that we have to talk about a little bit is how we're trained uh, from a very young age to dislike or even hate insects. Evolution, of course, has given us a natural fear of insects, which is understandable because some of them you know, can 
uh, sting or bite. Some of them can, uh, you can even have reactions to them. Some of them are even, you know, deadly. Some of the, some of the spiders and things like that. The other thing though, is the increase in urbanization and that includes the suburbs. And part of what's going on is because we have this lack of um, interaction with nature, we're just not being exposed to the insects like we used to be, you know, thousands of years ago or even hundreds of years ago. And that can um, lead to, you know, more phobias about insects. The other thing too, is that in our culture, and it's one of the things when I talk to kids a lot about, I say, what's the last commercial you saw with an insect in it? And of course, we all know, you know, the pesticide commercials. Um, I'm too cheap to buy into YouTube and I keep getting commercials for bed bug control or something like that. So, so we constantly are reinforced that insects are a negative thing in our culture. Even something like a Disney's A Bug Life, you know, the one that really looks like an insect, and, oh, and I've forgotten his name, but is the character, the, the evil one in uh, A Bug's Life. And all the bugs that are good bugs are things that are cute, okay? A very cute caterpillar, a cute ladybug, even the ants, um, which, you know, you could argue are not cute. In this film, they're made to be cute so that we like them. So why is this so important? And many of you have probably heard about this, but we, we talk about the insect apocalypse. This was an article that was in the New York Times a couple of years ago, or it might have been last year. And what they've been seeing is over the last so many years is this huge decline in insects. And in fact, um, one of the things that Ohio lepidopters do is we sponsor and manage the uh, longest, longest term butterfly monitoring project in the United States. And we've even seen a paper came out last year, the year before, we've seen at least a 20% decrease in butterflies. That number is probably higher because a lot of the areas that we monitor in Ohio are what I would call, you know, long-term park nature preserves. So these are things that are not changing. They're constantly, mon uh, they're constantly kept as a nature reserve versus something like you know, suburban areas or farm fields or things like that. The, um, and of, of course, everybody talks about, you know, when's the last time you hit a butterfly with your car? And remember, you know, when you were kids, having to stop to clean the windshield off. Kids today don't even know what that's like, you know. So some of the reasons for this is because, again, urbanization, uh, native habitats are disappearing, intensive farming. Um, this is really important because in, in, you know, days beyond, it was small family farms. And a lot of these farms had buffer zones um, where you would have native plants growing around the outside of the crops or even within the crops sometimes. Now there's this whole concept of clean fields where um, we like um, genetically modified crops that you can go in and spray Roundup. Um, so the entire field and the areas around them, and then they're big farms as well. So these areas um, no longer have these native plants in them. And if you think, well, I don't use pesticides. Well, um, a lot of the lawn chemicals also have pesticides in them, especially things that deal with lawn grubs um, that use neonicotinoids. And the problem with that is that they end up being picked up by the plants that you use and they come out like in the nectar or the leaves. And so insects um, using that nectar don't do as well. So why should I care that insects are decreasing? Um, hopefully you do care because that's why you're here. And, you know, I just put this in to be very blunt because we'll die essentially. If we don't have insects in our ecosystem, we're gonna lose a whole lot. We're gonna lose at least 30% of our crops. So if you enjoy apples or peaches, any fruit, a lot of our vegetables, um, things like that, even steak because, or beef because cattle eat alfalfa, which is pollinated, um, we'll lose a lot of our food crops. The other thing too is removing waste decomposers. So things that might be in the soil, um, you know, springtails and all these other types of insects. And just so you know, the big earthworms are not native and they're actually a problem, but that's a different lecture. Um, but if you don't have those insects to remove the waste and I forget there's some, you know, figure out there like we'd be covered in feet within a certain amount of period. 
And then also just in terms of an enjoyable world, um, we're losing our birds and our other vertebrates that depend on insects. And there was a study that came out last year and I forget, it was some huge number of songbirds are gone because a big part of it is that loss of habitat, the loss of food, and then just the regulation of um, all ecosystems. Uh, in this picture, um, I took this, I think, at Cedar Bog, and you have a little caterpillar on the left, and on the right, you have a wasp. And this is one of the uh, parasitoid wasps. It lays its eggs in the caterpillar, and that's what it's doing right now is it's searching for that caterpillar. So we have thousands of wasp species in Ohio that do this. So not only are pollinators important for our plants, but they're also important for regulating the amount of um, plant eating species that we have out there. Uh, if you ever enjoyed the butterfly house in summer, if you got went there late in summer at Cox Arboretum, you wouldn't see a, a leaf or anything on a plant because we kept predators out. And so the caterpillars would just strip all the leaves and a lot of the wasps and certain flies help keep that in check. All native insects are vital to something. Just because we don't understand it doesn't mean there isn't something there that they're important for, especially in the environment. But again, getting back to like pollination, surfid flies are probably the second most important pollinators after bees. And keep in mind that I would also argue moths um, because a lot of studies haven't been done on moths. Um, but then just in general, like the parasitoid wasps are really good at keeping caterpillars in check. Uh, paper wasps, things that um, actually eat caterpillars, they can take about like 2,000 caterpillars. They're very important um, pest control. A lot of people don't like the, what we call social wasps, like paper wasps, because they sting, but they do have a vital, important role in our ecosystems. One of the things I just want to mention here is domestic versus native. And you certainly heard that a lot in plants, but one of the things I really wanna make the point about is that honeybees are not native, okay? They've been domesticated for a long period of time. There are honeybees that are naturalized, meaning that they live on their own in the environment, but, um, or an ecosystem, but they were never really part of our North American ecosystem. I remember uh, a long gone uh, bee, scientists saying, why would I want to study honeybees? Would you ask a bird watcher if they want to go out and look at chickens? So similar to that. So really, when we're talking about increasing pollinators and insects in our yard, it really is all about the plants. It says that it's only when you look at a flower really close up that you can truly appreciate how beautiful it is and how many little creepy crawlies live in it. So one of the things I wanna mention is oftentimes when I give these kinds of lectures, I get, just tell me what to plant. <laughs> and I apologize, I'm sorry, um, but I don't really put lists in for a lot of reasons. I will mention certain plants, but the reason why I don't really talk very specifically about plants is that for a lot of different reasons. One, no yards are the same. I can grow something here that my neighbor can't. I mean, just the difference of a few feet can sometimes make a difference in a yard, whether it's because it's a wet or there's a different type of soil, um, shade or not, that oftentimes it's difficult to specify a plant for everybody. My style is not your style. You may not like the types of plants that I suggest. Biggest thing is that there are hundreds of different native plants. For example, there's 20 different species of goldenrod. So for me to try to mention, and anything that is native to Ohio and has a flower, has a pollinator associated with it. So really any native flower that you put into your yard is going to attract a pollinator, okay? So what I really wanna do with this talk is to make you understand what makes a good pollinator plant. First of all, we have to understand that this is a really, really old relationship and that flowers and pollinators have evolved for millions of years. So this is a, a fly fossil um, from the Essene epoch and they actually were able to identify pollen in the gut of this fossil. So this fly was loaded with pollen. So even far back in the past, 
um, plants were being pollinated by insects. So again, this is something that has evolved for millions of years. And so when we talk about these flowers, we gotta talk about, well, why are they attracting pollinators? What is it that I need to have in my yard to bring these pollinators in? And the big attraction is nectar, okay? That is what plants put out for to attract pollinators. I should really say to reward pollinators, okay? They have other things to attract the pollinators, but nectar is the reward. And if you've ever done that thing with honeysuckle where you pull it out, then you know that that is, and that's that picture on the right, that what nectar looks like, what it tastes like. So when we talk about these flowers, we have to kind of understand this relationship. And one of the things that's really important is understanding like why the flower is shaped the way it is and where nectar is found. So hopefully you can see my cursor there. Um, but if I look at this delphinium flower, if you look on the left, okay, of that flower, you'll actually see that's where the nectar is located, not at the front of this flower where we have pollen and the stamens and things like that. It's actually in the back of the flower. And this is really important. Every part of this flower it is, has evolved to help uh, pollinators get nectar and pollen, okay? Here's just some different shaped flowers and it shows you like the different locations um, that they have pollen. So again, like in this, I think this is like a snapdragon, all the way in this bottom left, all the way at the end, the nectar is down um, at, at the very end of the flower. Same thing um, up here, I forget what flower this is, but the nectar gland is actually up here for this particular one. Typically nectaries are going to be in these smaller flowers in this area, whereas these tube shaped flowers, they're all the way in the back. So that when the bee comes, cause this is typically for a bee, it actually has to crawl in the flower and past the pollen. So why is this important? Because again, each species of flower has evolved for a very specific pollinator or groups of pollinators. So it's not like I can just plant this shape flower, a sh short shape flower and expect to get certain types of, um, or all types of pollinators, I should say. So for example, here is a picture of a sphinx moth and we do have day flying sphinx moths. This one is not one that I, a picture that I took, this is actually from a different country, but it's a good example of a sphinx moth that have some of the longest proboscis in the world. And there are many different sphinx moths in Ohio. I think we have more than 20. Some of them are those little hummingbird hawk moths that you see look like little miniature hummingbirds flying around your flowers during the day. And they have, ex again, extremely long proboscis. And what they um, use those for is for very deep throated uh, flowers. So they have evolved to basically be able to use certain flowers. And in fact, most of our wild orchids, a lot of our wild orchids are pollinated by sphinx moths. So when we talk about our modern cultivars, we talk about putting flowers into our yard. Oftentimes, sometimes too, when I recommend things, people will say, well, I tried that and it didn't work. There's a lot of reasons why plants don't work in terms of attracting pollinators. A lot of our modern cultivars have been developed for our pleasure because we like extra petals or more bright colors or things like that. So for example, here you have a petunia cultivar and notice that it has multiple, multiple petals. Well, the insect can't even get into where the nectar is. On the right, we have a Ohio native petunia. I took that picture in Greene County. These petunias are all over in our wild areas. And you can see how simple it is and how easy it would be for an insect to crawl in there to get to the nectar. So this is why when we talk about using native plants, we're not just saying, oh, go native, you know, for the fun of it. There is a very specific reason why. And that's because again, the insects have adapted and the flowers have changed over a long period of time to help each other. Some of the other things that, there are tons of things that flowers do to attract pollinators, lots and lots and lots. 
um, and I'm just covering a few of them. I mean, there's even weird things like electrostatic charges that bees can see. Um, and when they touch the flower, the electrostatic charge is discharged. So the next bee coming along knows that that flower has already been uh, sampled for its nectar. So here we're talking about um, visual guides and there's a couple different kinds. One is just this um, nectar guide and that is like on this iris, this is our native uh, blue flag iris. And on here you see that lovely yellow and the lines and they're all directing that insect typically a bee down into the throat of that flower and down to where the nectar is. Um, one of the interesting studies was that flowers that don't have very good uh, nectar guides actually suffer more what we call nectar robbing, where the bee will come along the side or the back and actually chew through the flower. And when they chew through that flower, they're bypassing all the pollen, so they, they can't pollinate that flower. Um, one of the other interesting things is the sense of smell. And that's something that uh, I really feel the lack of in our modern day flowers. When I was a, a child and I, went, and I went to our um, my grandmother's garden, I remember these great big flowers and it was all these old fashioned flowers, but the smell was heavenly. Um, one of my big disappointments is roses. I don't grow them anymore because it's just too hard. They're not native. But if you go to like an an old garden with old roses, the fragrance is just almost overwhelming. And you go into a nursery now and like go up to like a knockout rose and there's almost no fragrance whatsoever. So that's something to think about. So also one of the things that um, flowers do is they have ultraviolet patterns. And if you look, uh, each of these pictures is showing you on the left what it would look like to us, but then on the right, is showing you what it would look like to an insect that can see ultraviolet light. And most, I think most insects can see ultraviolet, certainly bees and butterflies and flies do. And again, it's another type of nectar guide to guide plants, or excuse me, to guide pollinators to, to the nectar in the plant. So again, the other thing is that a lot of different flowers have different shapes and colors for different pollinators. Um, in our world, in what we call the new world, a lot of our prairie plants are yellow, so a lot of insects are attracted to yellow flowers. But you can see that some of these small bees um, can get right up in there into these um, flowers, and a lot of times we separate bees into short tongue and long tongue bees. These short tongue bees can get right up into these little individual flowers in the center of what we call flower and get nectar from them. Or things like large butterflies have places like on the petals to land and be able to then access the nectar. Smaller butterflies can just sit right in the center there and the flowers are along the outside of that particular flower. And again, here's another large butterfly, the tiger swallowtail that just loves button bush. I think it was made for them. And again, it's giving it a place to rest its legs while it's able to access the nectar. Uh, American snout, again, this is taken here. It's another butterfly you can get um, on Rattlesnake Master. And again, it's being able to land on this large flower and be able to insert its proboscis into the individual flowers on it. So again, why do we talk about natives or even cultivars? Lately, there's been a, a big push to, I shouldn't say a big push, but there's been a lot of cultivars out there of native plants like purple coneflower. And on the right there, you have a native um, coneflower and a question mark butterfly on it. And you can just kind of look at the difference between that and the ones on the left. So when we have these multi, uh, modern cultivars, we're, we're doing a couple of things. One, sometimes we're changing the color that attracts butterflies. Two, um, we're changing the flower itself, so it may not have access. Three, we may not even know what has happened to the nectar guides in the ultraviolet spectrum. They may have disappeared completely. Uh, when we change the shape of the petals, like on that echinacea cultivar on the far left, we don't, look at how short that is. So we don't know if we're missing some of the guide, the ultraviolet guide. We don't know if butterflies will be able, like our larger butterflies will be able to land on that. Um, so there's a lot of issues there. 
And then we don't know. Oh, and then the big thing about a lot of these cultivars is like, if you go into a big box nursery and you go to buy these flowers, you get a little tiny pack with big flowers on it because they want you to buy it. Um, and of course, you know, we're all attracted to color and big flowers. Nectar is very energy resource intensive. It's a lot of sugars and things that take a lot of energy for the plant to invest in. When you ask it to grow flowers, especially big flowers on a tiny plant, or you um, change colors or bigger flowers or all these things, some of them won't even produce nectar anymore. So that's why we talk about, again, going using native plants because we know that the native plants have the things that the, the insects need um, to be able to find the nectar. And just as a little side, because butterflies and moths are my, uh, one of my big deals, um, it's not just about the nectar, right? If you want these things in your yard, you have to provide the other things that they need. So many insects, certainly all the butterflies and the moths, require plant material to eat, right? And many of these insects, like the spice bush volatile, will only use one plant or two plants for their young. So we call them a host plant. So the spice bush swallowtail uses um, spice bush, also sassafras, as its host plant. It, the female will only lay its eggs on those plants. So if you want those types of things in your yard, like, like the spice bush swallowtail, one of the best ways is to plant its host plant. Moth caterpillars. People really, really don't like I shouldn't say that, but a lot of people don't really think about the moths, okay? And moth caterpillars are very similar to butterflies in that a lot of them use very specific host plants. Um, moths and butterflies are very closely related. In fact, I heard one scientist explain it as butterflies are just day flying moths. And if you ever get a chance, there are some beautiful moths out there. And many, many of the moths are pollinators at night. And it's a lot of fun to go out at night you can cover your flashlight with a little piece of red plastic and explore your flowers. And a lot of the flowers that are pollinated during day end up being pollinated at night. So here we have like a little common pug on a brown-eyed Susan, and they will typically eat things in what we call the composite family, all of these yellow flowers. But what's really important about that is that they provide so much of young birds diet so we have probably about 5,000 species of moth in Ohio versus like 150 uh, species of butterfly. A good portion of baby birds diet is moth caterpillars. So when we're only focusing on the small slice of insects like butterflies, we're losing all these other things that work in our ecosystems. Okay, so if we're going to start talking about natives beyond purple cone flowers, so I'll talk a little bit about some of our native plants that we use. First of all, there's every color um, in the world out there if you're like, yeah, but I don't want to use yellow. So these are all taken locally. Um, like you can have orange, like, you know, uh, in our milkweeds, you can have pink, and this is a rose pink. You can have purple, and this is a gentian. And of course, if you get to go out to Huffman Prairie in July, you get just a riot of all kinds of colors. So there's, there's all kinds of different plants out there that you can use and enjoy in your garden, similarly to the plants that we buy um, at nurseries. Any color you want, you could probably find there. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we're talking about um, selecting nectar plants for the garden, a couple of things. So we want to put as much variety in as we can. Again, some people want more of a manicured look. That doesn't always work, but you know, I'm more of a cottagey person. So like that prairie look to me is beautiful, but you can still put in quite a few things um, and make a more formal bed by planting large masses of a single color. Um, but maybe you have several masses in different places. So you want to think about again, the size of that plant, having a variety of size and shapes for that to, to attract the most number of pollinators. Same thing with color, 
having lots of different colors because different insects are attracted to different colors. You wanna think about the time of year. This is really important. Um, I took a trip out to Huffman Prairie with some of the folks that uh, work on the prairie out there. And we were there, I think in early, early May and we were looking for bumblebees. And I was looking around going, you know what? You guys don't have any uh, plants, any nectar for them other than some things that are invasives, non-native, which doesn't make sense because if, as you know, if you go out into the yards or if you go out in the wild, bees start emerging really soon. Like they, a little bit more warm weather, we're gonna get more bees here, but even in April. And a lot of these plants that we think of as pollination plants, a lot of these cone flowers and things like that tend to be summer plants. But spring, you need to think about what can I plant in my yard to help support these newly emerging bees, especially in the spring, because a lot of the females are coming out in the spring to get things ready to provision their nests. So it's really important. So some of the things that I put in here are like penstemon, golden alexanders, the dogwoods that, that uh, bloom in spring, spice bush, um, any of the spring ephemerals that are native are good. And a lot of those ephemerals, um, I've actually seen them in prairies and full sun in the spring as well as in the woods. So, so those kinds of things are things to think about in the spring. Summer is probably the easiest time for us to think about because you can go to any prairie and look around and see all the different flowers that are there. But some of the favorites are like the mints. And these are not your garden variety of mint that you make tea with. Um, these are some of the things like thin leaf mountain mint. Um, there's a bunch of native mints that are really wonderful in the garden. There are different liatrices as well. If you don't like that tall, very spindly look, there's some that are a little bit more bushy. And then I call them the prairie yellow gang. And that's because so many of our um, composite plants are yellow. But there's lots of them and they're short ones, tall ones, big, huge ones. So there's a lot of different ones that you can explore. Some that are better in full sun, some that are better in shade. There's lots and lots to, to look at. And then another important time is fall because those animals that are out or insects that are out in the fall are often really trying to provision their nest or themselves to survive through the winter. And of course we have monarchs that are migrating, but monarchs aren't the only butterflies that migrate. There are a couple of others that do as well. And so having nectar for them on their way south is really important. So again, in fall, there are goldenrods, sneezeweed and asters. And everybody looks at that list and they kind of go, oh, you know, roll their eyes. But when we think about goldenrods and we think about how difficult it is to have goldenrods in the yard, what we're really talking about is, is a very strange variant of tall or Canadian goldenrod that takes over. Like I said, there's 20 different goldenrods, some that are just wonderful in the garden. They're not very big, they don't take over. So it's, it's good to kind of explore what these different plants are. Same thing with sneezeweed, unfortunate name, doesn't make you sneeze. It just happens to be blooming the same time as, um, oh dear, it's gone right on my head, it starts with an R, but one of the plants that really does cause allergies. And then of course, asters are a wonderful plant as well for fall pollen and nectar. Okay, so lat names. <laughs> Every time I talk to people about, oh, you kind of have to know the Latin names, they roll their eyes. I don't blame them. You don't have to memorize them. You just need to understand that sometimes when we're talking about native plants, we have to talk about scientific names simply so that you get the right plants. So here's, a, here's an example. We have 80 different species of milkweed in the United States. We have 16 different species of milkweed in Ohio. And then people will come and say, well, I wanna have monarchs in my yard. What kind of milk, or you know, give me some milkweed. <laughs> and I'm like, well, which one? And they're like, what do you mean? <laughs> and it makes a difference. So here are the three that are the most popular, uh, butterfly weed, swamp milkweed and common milkweed. Butterfly weed is the orange one, the only orange one that we have that you see growing along roadsides quite a bit. 
Swamp milkweed is this lovely rose color. There is a cultivar that's called Ice Valley and that's white. Sometimes it's called rose milkweed. It's got a couple different common names. And then common milkweed, which is one that a lot of people, if you grew up on a farm, especially um, you are familiar with, it can grow very tall. It can be kind of aggressive in your yard. And here's the thing, different milkweeds are more or less uh, efficient for monarchs. And what I mean by that is that when monarchs feed on these plants, the caterpillars, they do better or worse. I'm not gonna go into all of that right now. I can do a whole, a whole lecture series on that. But if you're looking at, at pollination, you know, it really, it really doesn't matter that all milkweeds are excellent, but if you're looking at them for you know, monarchs, sometimes monarchs do better on some of these than they do on others. And some milkweeds, um, that I don't have listed here are actually toxic to uh, monarch caterpillars. So knowing at least that, you know, if you find a plant that you want to use, if you can at least write down the scientific name, then, or if you see one that somebody's using and, and you want that one, again, learning what that uh, name is and writing it down can help you um, get that plant for your yard and make sure that it's the right plant. So how to shop for these plants. So we are very lucky in the Dayton area. We have several different great native plant sales and it's a great way to learn as well. And I highly, highly recommend that you come to a, or go to a couple of these sales. Um, I'm typically, the one on the left is the Marianus Environmental Education Center's um, sale. I think we're coming up on the 10th year that we've been doing this. I volunteer for them. I'm usually at that sale. Um, and they, what's really cool about their sale is that it's all local stock. So every plant that they have there comes from originally from a plant that grew in Greene County, typically sometimes Montgomery County. So you have something that has evolved for thousands of years and you have its progeny, you have its children. So you know that that's a plant that is gonna work well for our native pollinators. This year it'll be June 25th. And then the other thing that we have is the Midwest Native Plant Conference. Both of these are held at Mount St. John's, or Mount St. John, which is the correct name I've been told. Um, many of us knew it as the Bergamo Center. Um, the Midwest Native Plant Conference actually is at the Bergamo Center at Mount St. John. But on Saturday, uh, I think that's the 22nd of July, uh, they have a very big uh, native plant sale. Now this is for with growers who come from all over the state. So you're going to have things there that aren't necessarily from our area because there are things that grow up in the Cleveland area that don't grow here but they're all very knowledgeable. So you can certainly talk to them about, you know, the plants, would that work for me in my yard here? And I've picked up some things there that are not easy to get here. Um, sometimes you can't get certain plants, like Meek won't carry them. So it's a great place to go. It's a great place to talk to people, to learn. The sale is open to anyone. Okay. If, you know, you want to start now because it's March and everybody really wants to get going on gardening. Um, then, you know, plant catalogs and online are fine. There are several native plant companies. Uh, one of my favorites is Prairie Moon Nursery. They have both plants as well as seeds. Um, a couple things to think about when you do this is that a lot of your like general seed catalogs that don't specialize in natives will say wildflower versus native. Often, I'm not really sure what the term wildflower came from because often they have things in them that are not native to the United States. Like they'll have wildflower seed mix um, versus something that is native to the United States. So something you wanna look for. The other thing you wanna do is if you see a plant in one of these things is, is check that plant's range. Uh, Prairie Moon Nursery is really nice because if you go to their site, they have a little menu at the bottom and you can actually check the range map and it'll give you all this information about where it's local to. So Prairie Moon is a great resource to look at, even just to learn about some of these plants. 
Um, and the great thing about growing from seeds or going someplace like Meek or the Midwest Native Plant um, Conference is that you know where these plants have come from and you know that no pesticides are used. And this is really important because when you go to like a nursery, not always, but a lot of times, they, the people that sell the plants aren't the ones that actually grow it. And oftentimes, if you ask them, are there pesticides on this, they'll tell you no, because they don't apply pesticides. However, when that seed was planted, when that plant was started at where it was grown at the growers, they will put pesticides into the soil and those stay there and they get taken up by the plant and they actually uh, are expressed. They're actually found in the nectar. And this is a big issue because it's been shown it won't necessarily outright kill the pollinator but it will reduce what we call its fitness, its health, so that it's more susceptible to disease and less likely to, um, to breed. Okay, so if we're talking about attracting pollinators, we also want to attract, excuse me, we also want to talk a little bit about um, keeping that pollinator in our yard as well. And so, you know, there's been a lot out there now about yard cleanup, and I call it embrace laziness because quite frankly, I'm a lazy gardener. And if somebody tells me I don't have to pick things up, I'm like, yes. <laughs> so we'll just call it providing habitat. And the reason that we talk about that is because so many of these insects use these things um, to overwinter. So like small bees use stems to lay their eggs in. Um, and the larva will, will grow up in that stem, eating the food that the mom has given it to emerge sometime, sometimes not even in spring, sometimes it's not until summer. Um, leaves, a lot of even butterfly caterpillars, when they become, um, go into their uh, chrysalis, they'll actually go down and do that in the ground, not like under leaves and things like that, what we call the duff. Um, and as an aside, the duff is that layer of leaves that falls in the woods. And if you've ever been to a pristine woods, that duff layer can be feet thick. It, it's really amazing. Remember I said earthworms are not native. Those giant earthworms that we have, they actually pull that duff, those leaves down uh, into the ground, which gardeners think is great because it breaks up the soil. But all of our insects, our small animals, our trees, our seedlings have evolved to use that duff as sort of a nursery habitat a place to hide, nest, um, hunt. And when that those leaves go, there's nothing for them to use them. So like if you go into some of our woods now, because these earthworms have gone all over, um, a healthy woods will have layers and layers of leaves. And oftentimes I'll walk through some of our woods and I won't see hardly any leaves on the ground. So that's an issue. Um, there's lots of information about there. I know that there's issues with, um, you know, sometimes with cleanup laws and things like that. So sometimes we have to sort of balance that. So sometimes I will like collect the sticks and things like that and just have a corner for them that I'll leave them in so the insects can finish their development. So sort of as a, a finale, uh, there's this quote by Emerson, uh, the inhabitants of the city suppose that the country landscape is pleasant only half the year. To the attentive eye, each moment of the year has its own beauty, and in the same field it beholds every hour a picture which was never seen before or which shall never be seen again. And so that's what I like to think about when we talk about these things is holistically, that even in winter there are things to look at, our stick piles, so to say. Um, you know, there are insects out in winter, which is really a lot of fun to see sometimes. Um, so, you know, opening our eyes to what should be there versus what has been there. So with that, um, we're plant natives and a bee will thank you or a butterfly or a wasp or a moth or a spider, <laughs> et cetera. <laughs>